Well, welcome back everyone to episode six of the Freedom Doc webinar series. I'm Adam Habig, your host, president and co-founder of Freedom HealthWorks. And I'm um, glad to have you all back if you've been with us from the beginning for this web series in association with Lean Frontiers. I'm happy that you've made it the distance. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we will run through a brief recap at the tail end of this episode, but this is a big one today because we've been nibbling away at the different aspects of what a true lean direct to consumer healthcare ecosystem would look like in our previous episodes. And today we put it all together. And that is a tall order in the 30 minutes that we've allotted to this lunchtime webinar series. So we'll jump right in, but thanks again for coming back for part six and here we go. For those of you new to the, the series, this is the chapter and verse what we've covered to date. So we started out talking about direct to consumer medicine, talking about then concierge versus direct care, really two, two uh, distant cousins within the same alternative healthcare uh, model. Um, talked about thriving in independent practice, and then also about building a local direct care micro network. So some of these are gonna be, uh, some of these were fairly in the weeds, and I think that, that the audience enjoyed some of the, um, the nuts and bolts uh, of this. Uh, we talked last episode about involving direct specialty care. Today, we bring it all together. And so we're going to talk a little more big picture today. Uh, we will reduce it to ground level as we go, but uh, bear with me as we, we dive right in uh, to the episode six, putting it all together. I always like to start with today's takeaways. If you get nothing out of these uh, episodes, um, here are the notes you need to take back with you uh, today. So first takeaway, Seems self-evident, but really innovation in medical care delivery must give producers and consumers of care what they demand. Um, it's, it's no secret that innovation in care delivery has lagged innovation in other aspects of healthcare, therapies, treatments, uh, new drugs, that kind of thing. The way we deliver medical care today is, is virtually unchanged from perhaps 30, 40 years ago. And that's where a lot of our problems arise. So innovation has to look at what producers and the consumers of care demand and provide that, number one. Number two, another recurring theme within this series, insurance-based payment systems will always lead to higher costs and poor value. Uh, remember back to episode one, I mentioned the story of my uh, a friend, a colleague of mine who owns a, a roofing business. And uh, when I went to him one day looking for a new roof for my house, he said, I don't deal with uh, consumers directly like yourself. I only deal with insurance companies. Well, why is that? Because I can charge them four times the rate I would have to give you for the same job. Um, Insurance-based payment systems, when you have a third party that has disintermediated a buyer and a seller will always lead to a higher cost and poor value simply because incentives are misaligned. We've talked about that ad nauseum. Uh, if you've been with us this long, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll understand that intuitively. Number three, and this is really the takeaway from today that matters, an alternative top to bottom care system is emerging parallel to the status quo. And it's built on the pillars of successful consumer businesses. That means clear value, attractive pricing and superior customer service. There are a reason why consumer service businesses today um, that are succeeding, they have these pillars in common. Look at your, look at your Uber, look at your, your Netflix, look at these different consumer service businesses that are absolutely erupting today. And then look at healthcare. Healthcare is a consumer service business. Why does it not reflect these attributes? Well, it does. And that's what we're going to talk about is what does it take for this parallel system to emerge that actually reflects these values. And then fourth, a little glimpse into the future. I believe that the future will entail two distinct parallel systems of care delivery that coexist and interface. And today, that's what we'll talk about. Uh, I just, I, I say that because an insurance-based system is almost impossible to unwind and to, to re-inject these pillars that we just talked about. So really a parallel system needs to emerge as an alternative that gives both consumers and doctors as producers of care another choice. 
and choice is always good in the marketplace. And, and so we're going to see how that's happening today. Those are your takeaways. Now, let's zoom the lens out and talk about what does a healthcare system really entail? And, and here's a hint, at its core, it's really a marketplace. So we have to define what a healthcare system is before we can show how a parallel system, a parallel ecosystem can emerge. So the healthcare system involves goods and services. That means primary care. We talked a lot about that. That means specialty care and specialty care is a wide net so many different aspects of care fall into the specialty care definition. That means hospital care, really inpatient care of all sorts. That means different types of ancillary services. We usually think of those as testing, imaging, and the sorts. And it means what I'll broadly categorize as consumables, right? Medications, vaccines, supplies, uh, DME. Again, this is not meant to be holistic, this is simply a, a, a high level view of what a healthcare system entails. It's got to deliver these things. It also has to allow for payment for these items. And like any marketplace, you have to attach a price for, to all goods and services in column one. That too often is where today's existing system fails. There are no clear prices attached to these goods and services. And you also have to have a funding mechanism. That's also where today's existing system breaks down quite a bit. The funding mechanism is so esoteric, it's so Byzantine, that co higher costs and, and confusion and inefficiency are almost inevitable. So when you look at this, if we were talking about a parallel system emerging, it must exhibit these attributes in column one, and it must have a payment mechanism, uh, and, and that means prices for all goods and services, and then funding. Well, folks, this is what we have today. This is the existing system. And this was a graphic produced, I believe by a member of Congress in the wake of the ACA passage. So you might've seen this in the past. Uh, I think it does a nice job of illustrating the complexity of what really should be a fairly simplistic system that provides goods and services and provides prices and a mechanism by which those who consume the goods and services pay for them. So here's your existing system. And then here's the emerging system that we're talking about today. And we teased this out last episode, but this is very elegant in its simplicity. And I wanna point out that it's set up in a way that each of those necessary elements that we said were required for a healthcare ecosystem, each of those goods and services are, are, are evident here. So at its core, you have your direct primary care, and if you've uh, been a loyal subscriber to this web series, you'll know that, that we feel very strongly that that needs to be at the core of this healthcare ecosystem. And that's, that's a, uh, a really a, an area of focus for us at Freedom HealthWorks. Get the direct primary care um, positioned in a way that the other elements of this ecosystem flow from that. So you have, as you go around from 12 o'clock at the top of this graphic, you have your, your medication dispensing, right? You have, as you move clockwise, direct care specialists. We've talked quite a bit about the, the appetite among specialists to migrate out of an insurance-based model and into a direct care model. It's viable, it's happening today, and um, stay tuned because it's, it's about to uh, get very exciting on that front. You have things like value-add services. Many times these are aesthetics, nutrition and diet, fitness and exercise, um, all part of the general wellness and, and general healthcare ecosystem. Keep moving around that um, clockwise direction. You have complementary insurance coverage, insurance being in quotes, because there are uh, tremendous innovations in this space that are set up to cover catastrophic and emergency type expenses. But one thing that this does, it allows insurance to go back to acting like insurance. And we're going to see how that works. And then as you move all the way around the circle back towards the top, you have your direct ancillary services. Um, these are the out-of-pocket items that are commonly encountered by anyone who, who, who needs care. So imaging, labs, vaccines, things like alternative therapies. Um, compare that to the previous slide. Everything you need for a healthcare ecosystem in terms of goods and services is right here on this page. 
That's the beauty of the emerging system. So let's talk about how this direct care system works. We start with our first takeaway from today. First, we identify what producers and consumers of care demand. And from a consumer standpoint, this could apply to any industry, not just, not just healthcare. But consumers today demand on-demand service, advice, advocacy, and guidance from a trusted expert for a clear price. Again, that could be um, lawyers, accountants, uh, really any sort of, of professional who interacts with a consumer is expected to deliver those things. Um, healthcare is no different. That's what consumers demand today from their doctors. Well, how about those doctors? You know, what are they looking for? They're the producers of care. No matter what you saw on that slide with this messy existing system, all value in healthcare is created at one place. And that's the intersection between a doctor and a patient. Everything else is just background noise. So what do those doctors demand? Well, they need to be unshackled from the idea of practice by billing code. These are, are, are some of the most highly trained professionals in modern society. And too often they're painting by number, according to the insurance company's billing codes. That has to end. They need time for follow-up activities outside the office, primarily advocacy and advisory roles. Uh, we'll talk about this and we have in the past that, you know, really the new role of a physician and, and really primary care is, is at the forefront of this, is acting as a medical counsel. And if you think about that from, the, from an attorney's perspective, and it's, I always liken it to the legal field because that's one with what I'm intimately familiar with. Um, if as an attorney, I don't have an answer for you as a client, I go find someone who does, someone I trust, someone I know we can rely on, and someone I know who's gonna give you good value. That's what doctors are doing in this emerging parallel system. They're no more, it's no more uh, drive by handoff. It's let me uh, get you the kind of care you need and be your advocate, be, be your advisor outside of my office. Doctors also, bullet point three, need a predictable, stable revenue stream. And we've talked about why the recurring revenue subscription model is better for both parties, for buyers and sellers, when it comes to that. They need a manageable, manageable patient load. All right. No more 35, 40 patients a day where a, a doctor's running two hours behind and really can't give full time and attention to that individual case. Manageable patient loads equate to better care just because these experts in the medical field have more time and more energy and more resources to apply to each individual case. Uh, we say a return to independent practice is what doctors are demanding. And this is simply it goes hand in glove with the last point, the complete alignment of interests with patients. Doctors really need to be serving their customers and their customer is the patient and should be the patient. And when you disintermediate that relationship, oh, interests get misaligned in ways that neither side really intends. Uh, but that's a big part of why we have such a mess today. Uh, it's not because doctors in, in, intentionally um, misalign interests. It's because the way that, that the, the existing system is set up, they owe their allegiance to other masters. And if they don't, there are serious consequences. So this is why we think independent practice is, is really requisite to um, this emerging parallel system and why doctors really demand that. Here are the core principles. And number one, there is no one system perfect for everyone, all right? Anyone can, can take pot shots at any proposed model, any, any idea that is put forth and find you know, the, the exceptions that really, um, you know, are, are, that they highlight and say, well, the whole model needs to be chucked out because look at this, this, this one person over here who is not gonna fit in this model. No, no, forget about that. Focus on lowering prices and increasing customer value for the majority of participants. That should be the focus. Reduce prices instead of arguing over who pays the bill. So much ink is spilled in our country about, well, I'm gonna pass the buck to, to, to him and you pass the buck to her and who's gonna pay this bill? Focus on reducing the price, not over who pays the bill. Secondly, higher value, what does that mean? 
It's pretty simple here. Higher value means better customer service and in the end, long-term cost savings. That's what you get from this model. You get better customer service, more delighted consumers of healthcare. And in the end, you're going to get long-term cost savings. All right? We've shown that how that is, is absolutely um, proven out in this model. And we'll talk about one of our FAQs was how does, how does this model effectuate cost savings? Well, in the end, um, uh, you're going to see overall spending decrease when you invest more, you spend more at the, the relatively low cost primary care level and you allow marketplace discipline to lower, to reduce the prices you're paying within the entire ecosystem. So that's, that's a little prelude uh, to a later slide. So again, core principle one, no system is perfect, focus on lowering prices and increasing value for the majority. Number two, increase the supply of care to satisfy demand. We have a huge problem in this country that, that is rarely talked about because I guess the general public garners little sympathy for physicians. Um, but we need to, to really end physician burnout and attrition if we are going to um, you know, have really a, a, a highly skilled and, and sufficient physician, um, you know, the ranks of physicians in the future. So let's increase the supply of care to meet demand uh, from consumers. Let's do it by ending physician burnout and attrition. And let's remove also those barriers that frustrate patients' access to care. That's a critical point. So those, both of those go into increasing supply of care. Number three, allow the market to drive down prices. When you empower the buyers and sellers of care of anything, really, to set market prices, inevitably they become affordable. If you have a producer of anything, widgets or medical care, who has set a price above which the market can pay, no one will pay it. So market discipline drives down prices to a point where Buyers can afford it and sellers can afford to sell at that price and keep their head above water. That's the power of market discipline. Number four, let insurance revert to a financial safeguard against unforeseen catastrophic expense. That's what it is. That's what it wants to be. That's, that's in its DNA. Insurance is nothing more than financial instrument. We have to remember that too often it's the currency um, by which we pay for medical services and that's just wrong. What will happen is that premiums then will decline for the majority of Americans when they reflect the actual underlying health risk of the individual. That's the natural consequence. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in, in some of the, um, the alternative insurance products, I'm using insurance in air quotes, um, that have entered the marketplace, much more affordable, great value for those folks who've availed themselves uh, of those products. So how does this work for patients? Well, let's look at fill patients. All right, let's say Phil needs routine medical care, which is about the only care 90% of us need each year. I love that stat. I think mean, it's, it's, it says a lot. Um, the solution is really subscription pricing removes barriers to routine care. So here are some examples. Um, and when I say doctor, I mean primary care doctor. You know, Phil enjoys office visits whenever he needs them with his doctor who develops a rapport and gets to know him. No extra cost for nearly anything that can be handled in office. I think that is one piece of value that gets so overlooked, it's tragic. I've referenced this in past episodes, but there was a, a British Medical Journal article that talked about the increase in life expectancy and the decrease in adverse events when you have a physician who simply gets to know his patient for 12 months or longer. All right, these are highly trained, highly skilled individuals, and it's tough for them even to whisk into a room and from a paper chart, discern what's going on with this particular patient in 12 minutes. Never seen the guy before, never seen the patient before, no rapport whatsoever, trying to decide what's happening here. That's a terrible way to practice medicine. This, when a, a patient and a physician get to establish a longstanding relationship, this is how medicine should be practiced. Urgent care is handled in office rather than emergency rooms or external urgent care clinics. Anybody who's been to an urgent care clinic um, you can tell your own horror story, but the point is these things are handled by a doctor that is that the patient knows. 
there's wide open communications, texting, calling, video chats, anytime. Um, because when you're sick, you can't wait three weeks for an appointment. You just can't. There's also the likelihood that Phil's doctor offers other valuable services, diet and nutrition, exercise guidance, you know, questions and concerns regarding new therapies or, in our case, recently ongoing pandemics. And then I mentioned this earlier, Phil's doctor acts as medical counsel for any care that takes place outside the four walls of his office. That's the new role for a primary care physician under this direct care model. I also threw in here dental and optometry um, subscription-based because we have a lot of employers that tune in and, and you know, we're, we're looking at both a healthcare ecosystem and the components of a health benefit. And so these are two common options included in your in that 90% of routine uh, or the routine care that 90% of us need each year. Usually it includes dental and optometry as well. There are great subscription-based options just like there are for your primary care doc for these types of things as well. Moving on, let's say Phil incurs out-of-pocket expenses. Well, he's gonna follow his doctor's lead and get discounted pricing for out-of-pocket items. So most commonly, this is not a, a comprehensive list, but most commonly you're talking about prescriptions, and immunizations. Under this new model, both of these are available at Phil's primary care doc, doctor's office. Um, if there's medication that's needed that, that the, the physician does not carry in office, he can research the best pricing using available cash discounts. So again, it goes into that medical counsel role that doctors are playing. Same thing if there's imaging needed. Uh, usually these docs have, and, and at Freedom Health Works, we help them keep a, a list of discounted options available for patients. Um, so that's where you get some of these, these huge eye-popping pop, eye savings, right? Uh, people love to talk about the MRI for 400 bucks when a local hospital may charge $3,000. Um, you ask again, well, how does this lower cost across the ecosystem? There's a prime example, right? Just shop around, make sure you know what you're paying for, get a clear price. We feel that the doctor's role in that is paramount. And also lab testing, same kind of thing. Um, many times, most common lab tests can be handled in office uh, at the primary care level, and you're going to get a cash discount. Here's an example of a lipid panel for 25 bucks when a hospital may charge 300. So you start to look at these and, and you see that there are ways not only to prevent major expense down the road by maintaining better health, but also when you do purchase healthcare to be a smart shopper, to be a good consumer. And the physician in our, in our new model plays a central role in that. How about downstream care? There's, there's always a question around this, right? Uh, Phil needs downstream care, which means really anything beyond the primary care level. So the solution here, let Phil's primary care doctor navigate the system for him and let insurance act like insurance. So for specialty care, and there are, there are direct, uh, direct care specialists on uh, listening today, and, and we've worked with many of them. Um, there is this vast emerging community of, of direct care specialists who are um, very ready, willing, and able to provide the type of, of elevated service and value that would go hand in hand with the same kind of direct primary care value. So in this case, let's say a specialist is needed and it's a podiatrist. Well, Phil's doctor may reach out to an independent podiatrist who is not, uh, who, who is unbeholden to a hospital for a consultation. We say that because uh, too often, um, again, hospitals impose perhaps um, unwritten quotas and, and expectations. And we want a doctor that is, com that, that is absolutely independent from that to, to objectively assess Phil's condition and decide, does he really need a high price procedure or can he get, a, can he get by with uh, perhaps some physical therapy or something first? The other point here is, with access to specialists all over the country, Phil gets a wider array of choices and better value. Takeaway there is medicine is now a national and even international marketplace. So for most care that's non-emergent, you're now looking coast to coast for solutions for, for, for providers of that care and to find the best value. You're no longer limited to simply looking around your, your neighborhood. Uh, perhaps Phil's doctor schedules a virtual consult first, you know, maybe you can avoid some unnecessary testing or expense in that direction. Either way, all prices are clear and, and upfront. And that goes, that dovetails into surgery. Um, the vast majority of surgical procedures are elective. So there's plenty of time to research and plan ahead to achieve the best value. Here's where you get, again, that headline rate 
sample use case of a knee replacement um, at a traditional hospital, you could be looking at $44,000 sticker price. Now, maybe you don't pay all that. Maybe insurance covers some of it. Who knows, right? But at a cash-based independent surgery center, maybe 15000 So this is where employers need to take note. Uh, if you're not already looking at these types of innovations within your benefit plans, you need to. And then hospital, we always need this as a backstop, certainly catastrophic insurance coverage um, to provide a financial backstop against emergencies and long-term care. That's never going away. There are innovative ways to do that. And that's where I mentioned that there's, it's not a total parallel system that is quarantined from the existing system, but it does interface with the existing infrastructure at certain points. And that's a good example of where that might occur. So putting it all together, here are the sample economics uh, for Phil's, Phil's really uh, the cost of his, his health care, right? his health benefit. Um, Freedom Doc primary care coverage, simple flat rate, uh, perhaps catastrophic coverage through a health share, something similar. Dental, vision, uh, and then the inclusion of these discounted affiliate specialist networks or discounted ancillary services are included in that. Again, there are going to be out-of-pocket costs, but there are out-of-pocket costs today. When you look at the folks who are um, absolutely, uh, they call them functionally uninsured. And it's, it's where you're paying through the nose for health insurance, but you still face enormous out-of-pocket costs, deductibles, things like that. Certainly those are not going away, but at least in this model, you have a very affordable monthly spend and you have uh, good visibility in terms of how much each of those out-of-pocket items will cost. From a consumer standpoint, no barriers to care whenever it's needed, none. You need care, you get care. Clear prices, no more hidden charges, surprise bills, no more fear of seeing the doctor. And you get to rely on a trusted expert for all things medical. From an employer standpoint, as it relates to group health benefits, since I know we have employers listening today, um, it's important that your benefits are recognized as valuable and appreciated by employees and their families. And I, I get this as, as an employer myself. These are, it's important that you're going to great lengths to provide health benefits. And it's important that people see the value. Well, why not focus on enhancing the value of the benefits that people, employees, and their families use the most? Focus on enhancing that value uh, to get most bang for your buck. Also, you need minimal drag and intermediary costs when you're setting these up and administering. A clear price tag would be fabulous to know what things cost rather than a black box strategy of, well, we'll wait and see what future employee is going to cost me. And then you're going to lower that total cost, especially for those of you who are self-funded and have exposure to the bottom line of their own health plan. Um, but the two big prevention due to the removal of barriers, you're going to catch a lot more early you're going to spend more on primary care, which is relatively low cost, and much less on higher cost when, when uh, elements when things break down. And then market pressures. When pricing is transparent, you get the knee replacement for fifteen thousand rather than fifty. So this is the future: two parallel coexistent systems, a traditional insurance-driven system that we know today and an alternative direct care system that is emerging. So some FAQs that came in and appreciate everyone sending in questions ahead of time. I picked about a half dozen. Uh, number one, how does this ecosystem solve for the high cost of healthcare? I'll go back to those two bullet points on the previous slide. Number one, through prevention. When you deploy more resources on relatively low cost primary care activities, you reduce expenditure on relatively high cost activities when things go sideways. Um, that's an ancient, you know, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure type of an answer, but it's true. And there's empirical evidence to back this up. Um, the, big, the, the key here is removing those barriers. You don't want anyone the minute they're feeling chest pain or having a headache or think something's not right, you don't want to put barriers in front of them to getting clear answers. You want them to have a personal relationship with a physician, someone who can uh, weigh in on those, on those issues early and prevent anything going <clears throat> catastrophically wrong. Excuse me. 
Sorry, the other um, point <clears throat> with FAQ number one I want to make is that by allowing, by reintroducing market discipline uh, when care is needed, um, you allow prices to fall to that market equilibrium that I mentioned. And that's the, that's the knee replacement example. You eliminate hidden prices in narrow networks and you allow consumers with the help of their medical counsel to shop around. So those are the two points. That's how this ecosystem really solves for the high cost of healthcare. And again, empirical evidence bears this out. This is not theory and conjecture. This is happening today. Great question, number two, how do we educate the average person and overcome consumer hesitancy for out-of-pocket payments? I'd say this is already happening. Um, more and more people face these sky-high deductibles and consumers in general are looking this direction. You know, it's bad when one third of insured Americans each year skip necessary medical care for fear of unknown costs, right? We talked to a huge swath of our population may have an insurance card in their back pocket, but they are functionally uninsured because they face very steep out-of-pocket costs if they needed to actually consume healthcare. So they are functionally uninsured. I think we need to just, the awareness is the big part of this, right? People are looking for solutions, they're hungry for solutions, um, showing them that this is working and it's, it's viable today. Uh, I think it's hard to find uh, consumers uh, that walk around and once you explain this to them, they say, that's a terrible plan. I don't want anything to do with that, right? Most people come running for this when they understand how it works, but it's tough because we're conditioned in this country to think of our healthcare through the lens of health insurance. And that, that is a difficult mindset to change sometimes. So I think education, awareness is, is big. Um, I, I think you gotta use ground level examples. And I had this just the other day, someone was asking me, well, why should I, you know, why would I embrace these discounted cash prices from my physician when my insurance company, uh, you know, they get me steep discounts. And, you know, I said, well, great, that, that's fine. Um, you know, maybe they'll add, you know, coffee coverage to your uh, plan next year. And, uh, but that doesn't help you when you walk into Starbucks, if a cup of coffee costs you $300 and they're getting you half off, you're still not in a good place. No, that's true. So the point is you have to look at this and, and use you know, those types of examples to, to show people that when they think they're getting a good deal, it really needs to, you really need to examine what's under the hood, right? A big discount is not a good deal if the starting price is sky high, like that Starbucks example. Number three, how do we establish market rates for care services? Great question. Um, short answer, the old fashioned way the old fashioned way, supply and demand. Um, what this parallel model allows, when I say that market discipline will allow prices to drift down to their natural equilibrium, when you look at the knee replacement, um, that uh, physician, that practice that, that specializes in, in cash-based surgery, they're looking at all the inputs that it takes to perform that service, all right? Physician's time, facility costs, you name it. But they do it in... In, in really a, a fresh and a pure way. So none of those costs are just, just distorted by that mess we saw earlier of the existing healthcare system. So they get to actually look and say, well, this knee replacement costs X amount of hours and I need a facility for, for X amount of hours and I need these supplies and this equipment and you build a price that way. And this is done in every other industry, every other industry besides healthcare. And that's how you arrive at a true cost for these services. So. When you say market rates, uh, and you can look at other, other um, I guess, indicators if you like, but I like the pure method. Look at what it takes to deliver the service, set that uh, price accordingly and build in a profit margin and, and away we go. The market will be happy with what you, what you show them. So another question, what are examples of health situations when the insurance-based system would be the best option? Great question. And again, one important point is we are not talking about displacing what's there today, all right? Um, this is simply offering an alternative for both buyers and sellers of healthcare who don't like what they see in the system today. So I know there are situations and, and perhaps these are um, obviously things like emergency care when you don't have the time or the wherewithal to be selective about where you're going. If you're bleeding out, you need to be to the nearest hospital immediately in the trauma center. 
uh, hospital care, uh, long-term high expense elements like oncology, there are definitely places where there's intersection between the emerging system and the existing system. Those are the pieces that we think a, a physician, a direct primary care physician is best suited uh, to help navigate. But certainly uh, we're not talking about two siloed systems. There is some, some interfacing between the two. So those are the situations I, I could think of top of my head. This also does, um, there is a policy impact from this too. Um, you know, things like, like state-based uh, high-risk pools might be something to look at from a policy standpoint um, as, as these two systems uh, conjoin. Number five, what will it take for more doctors to transition to direct care? Well, one is awareness. Doctors need to know there is an alternative. And if you're happy with what you see today in the existing system, great. If you're unhappy and perhaps looking at quitting early or getting out of medicine, please, please, please take a look at what direct care can bring to your, your life, both personally and professionally. Uh, I think number one is, is getting the word out. Number two is what we do all day long at Freedom Health Works, and that is examine and eliminate the three levels of risk, the three obstacles that, that really restrain most physicians from moving this direction. In order again, those are the transition anxiety, right? the risk involved with moving to a new model that is, can be somewhat unfamiliar and daunting, number one. Number two, operational risk. How do I run a business? I have no idea. Um, and number three, economic risk. What if nobody shows up? Those are, that's it. Those are the three risks that confront most doctors looking at this, whether you're primary care, whether you're special, a specialty doctor. Um, those are the three risks that, that need to be addressed. And, and those are the ones that we focus on. All right, number six, what will it take for employers to integrate direct care into their health benefits? Uh, I think I'll go back to awareness again. You know, wake up. This is the second largest item on most companies' PL each year. So if you are a business owner, you're an employer, whether you like it or not, you are in the healthcare business. It doesn't matter if you manufacture widgets or anything else. You need to understand um, at, at a minimum level what it is you're getting into each year. I, I think one of the biggest issues, the, there are tremendous success stories out there from benefits advisors in this space that have put together tremendous programs not just on a dollars and cents level, but you know, health outcomes improve, satisfaction improves, you name it across the board, it's just a better product. Um, sometimes it blows my mind how, how those types of plans, those types of innovations have not really spread more widely. But I think that there are, there are entrenched gatekeepers many times whose incentives are not 100% aligned with the employers. And Again, if you're a busy business owner, um, you don't have time to educate yourself on this space. You're worried about making your bottom line with the, the, the elements you do understand, which is your core business. So you outsource this a lot of times to a gatekeeper who may not have an interest in, um, in putting you into something that is this innovative because he's, he's worried about his bottom line. And that's okay. That's natural. That's, that's human, right? Um, so I think Again, employers have to look outside. They have, to, they have to look around sometimes the gatekeepers that uh, they may have trusted for 30 years to do them right uh, because those people sometimes don't either don't understand this or perceive it as a threat. It doesn't have to be, uh, but they perceive anything different as a threat. Um, I think on the, on the benefits advisor side within the direct care movement, you know, our advisors have to present clear solutions to those curveballs. I think a lot of them have done that, but there's always some you know, some outlier, well, I, you know, I've got these employees who exhibit X, Y, Z, and, and do they fit within this new model or not? Yeah, everybody fits within the new model. But, you know, I, I think from our standpoint, the advisors that are constructing these really need to um, have answers teed up for those curveballs. And one thing I'll say is, you know, is something to think about too, from the employer side, you know, is that linkage between health benefits and employment, is that fraying? You know, that's a relic of World War II that we just have continued to kind of drag along into the 21st century. But are people starting to ask why are employers even in the healthcare business? I think that's something for policymakers to think about. Is it, is it really efficient to have employers play that role any longer? Um, with a few tweaks, I think that you could level the playing field and now individuals would be um, essentially... Uh, brought up at the same level as employers in terms of, of tax treatment and things like that. 
so they could then seek out the best benefits for their family and not be constrained by whatever the employer has offered. So something to think about. Again, this is the emerging system. I'm gonna to conclude today with just a quick recap of our previous episodes. Uh, I appreciate you sticking around this long. This is it again. Uh, I'm happy to share this if anyone uh, would like to, to uh, take this away and, and examine more clearly. But again, the whole point is everything you need within an ecosystem is resident on this graphic. And this is what is, it is emerging today. I don't think that it's, it's pie in the sky you know, futuristic. This is, this, is what's, this is what's emerging today as a parallel system. Here's a map um, of the, the, our freedom docs across the country in different, um, different specialties, different subspecialties. This is an outdated map. There are more map dots today. I borrowed this one old presentation. But you see the, the litany of different, um, different um, areas of focus for these different practices around the country. But again, the important thing here is to think of um, Think of healthcare and, and medical care as a national marketplace today, because that's what's emerging and that's, that's the future. Here's a quick series review. And we're a little bit over time, so I'll, I'll be brief. Again, if you missed these episodes, these are quick recaps. Uh, episode one was about direct-to-consumer care. We talked about the key components uh, on really a philosophical level. You've got to have pricing clarity. Recurring revenue is great the convenience of on-demand services and fully focused expertise on critical issues. Don't, don't take a, a skilled doctor away from what he or she does best, which is to heal that patient, focus on the critical issues at hand. Key takeaways, borrow successful efficiencies from other industries. To lower cost, you must first know the price. Eliminating barriers drives consumer satisfaction. And insurance is a great financial instrument, but it's the wrong currency for most medical care. So kind of a nice book. And that was our first episode uh, and really a lot of parallels with today's episode. Episode two, we talked about two distinct versions of direct consumer care, concierge versus direct. Key similarities, they both are highly convenient, on demand. They uh, both give doctors more time to fully focus on critical issues. They both of recurring practice revenue. Key differences, really concierge continues to bill insurance. So it's somewhat of a hybrid model, which is great. This is saying nothing about um, the efficacy is one or the other. If that works for you, great. The more choices consumers have, the better. Episode three was all about thriving in direct care. And I think there are a couple of takeaways here. Uh, really know that it is once again, viable and rewarding to be independent with a direct to consumer model. You must recognize the difference between thriving and merely surviving. That's as a physician. Focus on the vital few, outsource the rest. That could be applied to any business under the sun. Focus on your vital few, outsource as much as you can. Time is money. Time lost is always costlier than you think. Right? Get there today if you can um, by waiting, by, by taking longer to grow your business or your practice in this case. Uh, it's costlier than you think. And no practice or business is an island. You're going to have connective tissue to other similar businesses, peers, um, up and down really this ecosystem. And that's a great lead into number four. Episode four was building micro networks. So the optimal ecosystem of care for most consumers is a micro network of medical professionals working together. Uh, localized has taken on a new meaning today. So be mindful that localized often means uh, it can mean four states away, frankly. Um, key components are the same. Unfettered communication between professionals, clear handoffs and follow-ups, persistent patient advocacy, and of course, transparent pricing. So building one of these is, is really important to succeed in this new model. Um, plugging into the emerging communities around direct care is key. Last episode, we talked about specialists. We had a couple of great guests. They confirm that yes, independent direct specialty care is viable today and it's growing very quickly. Um, these consumer businesses must deliver the three pillars, clear value, attractive pricing, superior customer service. The pricing, because there's quite a bit of differentiation between the, the customer experience, we'll call it, among different specialists, the pricing must reflect the patient encounter. So if it's ongoing, it must reflect that. If it's an episodic one shot, it must reflect that. 
Um, a robust acquisition pipeline is critical and independent practices have the advantage of running lean and mean. Be sure you are if this is something on your radar. Today's takeaways again, episode six, wrapping all this up, innovation in medical care delivery must give producers and consumers what they demand. So identify what that is and make sure that it gives them what they demand. Insurance-based payment systems always lead to higher costs and poor value, but there is hope. Number three, an alternative top to bottom care system is emerging parallel to the status quo, built upon these successful or these pillars of successful consumer service businesses. And the future will likely entail these two distinct systems coexisting and interfacing side by side. So that wraps up episode six of our webinar series. I uh, wanted a uh, quick uh, reminder, the first Freedom Doc conference that brings together different elements of this ecosystem is on the calendar. It's coming up quickly. Invitations are available now. Please reach out if this is of interest to you. We look forward to it. Uh, it should be a fantastic presentation. Uh, that's October 22nd to the 24th. So once again, uh, feel free to reach out if you so choose. Appreciate you um, hanging out and hanging with me all six episodes. Um, we'll see you at the freedom.conference. Skylar, back to you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, just a re quick reminder that you will receive a recording 24 to 48 hours after this presentation. If you do have any questions, please contact me or Adam, and we would be happy to answer anything that you have. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us the past six episodes. Have a great day.